when I was in fifth grade, I had a friend who told me that her family had invited our teacher over to their home for dinner. I was fascinated by this crossing of boundaries. In my mind, teachers were for school and family was for home. In fact, I had suspected that teachers lived at the school. And so I was very taken with this idea of this boundary crossing, a teacher coming into your own home and then to eat there. So as I walked home that day, a thought began to build and come to fruition. I announced it when I walked through the door saying to my mom, Mom, I want to invite my teacher to our home for dinner. And she said, I, yeah, where do you get these ideas? And I said, Mom, please, my friend got to have our teacher over for dinner. I want to do it. And my mom said, but what do white people eat for dinner? Hmm. I paused. That was actually a good question. What do white people eat for dinner? Well, I told my mom, you know, at, at school for lunch, we eat tater tots and uh, pizza pockets and peanut butter sandwiches. Maybe we can serve that. But my mom said, well, I don't really know how to make those things. And I said, okay, I'm gonna ask our teacher. So does that mean I can have her over for dinner? And my mom sighed with a sigh of resignation. This teacher would be the first white person to come into our home. And we rarely ever had guests anyway, because, you know, I was in fifth grade and we had just really got to this country and we didn't really know much about the big, big world out there. Each day was just trying to make ends meet, trying to become a little more acquainted with the language. And mostly we were just trying to avoid trouble. Well, my teacher was delighted with my invitation. And I said, so uh, what do you eat for dinner? What do you like to eat? And she said, I love Chinese food. <laughs> well, I felt a big relief. That's great. And as we set the date and the time, she said, oh, can I bring a dessert? And I said, oh, no need. And then I went to recess and I asked my friend, what is a dessert? And she said, oh, it's something sweet you eat after dinner. And I thought, what? You're full from dinner and you're still gonna eat some more? <laughs> so I thought about what we had that was sweet at home. And I remember that we had a bag of preserved dried plums. Maybe we would serve that for dessert. So I told my mom that we would have to serve dessert because I said she didn't need to bring any. And my mom said, oh, uh, what is that? And I'm like, well, it's something sweet you eat for din after dinner. And mom said, oh, well, there's this cake in the fridge. I'm like, what, we have a cake in the fridge? And so I said, well, that's great. D uh, dessert is set. And this young woman who was my teacher came and we were so happy for her to be there. And we put, you know, had her sit down at the table and then we put the food right in front of her and we all stared at her <laughs> and waited for her to respond to our food. And she picked up the chopsticks and looked at us and I, and, uh, and she was trying to pick up the food and I, oh, mom, mom, go find the fork. 
there's a there's a fork somewhere go find the fork and so we gave her the fork and she and we're like do you like the bok choy do you like bok choy and she said i yeah uh but she was uh, it was obviously kind of big and i said is it too big is it too big and she's like well uh do you have a knife and I, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we have a knife. And so we went to the kitchen and brought the cleaver. <laughs> we can cut that bok choy for you. <laughs> Set it down on her plate and start cutting it with the cleaver. And, and you know, it took me a long time before I figured out that in most American homes, there was a knife and a fork at the table. So we chopped up her bok choy for her and she ate everything and she really enjoyed it. And she said she did. And it made us so happy that she enjoyed her food. And now that dinner was over, it's time for dessert. So I pulled out the tin from the back of the fridge and took out the cake. But as soon as I sliced it, I'm like, ooh, there's something wrong with this cake. It's stiff. Someone at church had given it to us and they said it was going to be fine in the fridge for a long time. And so I thought, well, there's some, I think something happened to this cake. And I thought there would be fruit in it, but there's no fruit in this cake. It's just a bunch of strange candies on top. So I thought, oh, well, well, this is what we have. So I, I put the slice of cake apologetically in front of my teacher and she stared at it and she kind of smiled and i said by way of explanation it's a fruit cake but i think they forgot to put the fruit in the cake and she <laughs> laughed a little and and she said oh i love fruit cake and i oh she loves fruit cake and even without the fruit and i'm like okay and she ate the whole thing and she said it was delicious and it was may and only years later did i realize that fruit cake was a christmas food and that that fruit cake had been sitting in the fridge for those many months <laughs> well god bless that woman she came into our home and received everything we gave her and she gave us this blessing of receiving from us as immigrants we were often made fun of you know at school they made fun of my dress and my manners and my speech and and they made fun of us at the grocery store for the food we ate and for our poverty and for our ignorance. And we were always the object of people's charity. But now my teacher came to our home and received from what we gave her. And so she gave us a blessing of being able to give to her. And she received our hospitality as a gift and a joy and a joy and so in receiving that she gave us our dignity that what we had was worthy i think about this in the the scene in the book of acts and i think about how cornelius has received peter into his home and he's going to offer them dinner he, Peter and his men. And I imagine Cornelius going to the kitchen and say, saying to the cooks, the men from Judea will be dining with us tonight. And I imagine the cooks say, what do they eat? What do people in Judea eat? What do we serve? Go ask him, go ask him what they eat. So I imagine Cornelius going to Peter and saying, what would you enjoy eating? And Peter saying, oh, we love Gentile food. Well, if Peter had said that, then he really did understand that vision, 
that he had on the rooftop in Joppa, where a blanket of animals descended from the four corners. And in it, in that vision, was in his imagination everything he could eat that would repulse him, or what other people ate that could repulse him. And God said, kill and eat. And when he it was able to notice that this was what repulsed him and then he would say yes to it, that was something really important about what it meant about what the church was going to become. That he would receive what would repulse him was a boundary crossing. And here to receive Cornelius' hospitality was to receive something that in his imagination was not who he was, not he, what he could do. And this is the kind of hospitality in this book of Acts here, is to receive, not to give. And because to receive is to relinquish power and to give power to the other, to give dignity to the other. And this is the mechanism in the book of Acts for boundary crossing, to receive, to see as within one's own relationship, another who is very different. So a new people is being created in the book of Acts, a people born not of tribe or of language or of cuisine, but born of the Holy Spirit. The Jerusalem church down south heard about what happened with Peter and Cornelius and this scandalizing meal with uncircumcised people, and they wanted to talk to him. And Peter understood where they were coming from because the Jews had to protect themselves with the, these ritual rites and these dietary rules because as a people, they had been always so oppressed. First, slavery with Pharaoh, then the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire, and then the Babylonians that took them into exile. They were always on the edge of annihilation. And here they were again under occupation by Rome. So these dietary rules and rituals defined them, gave them an identity, gave them protection. And to leave these rules was a huge imagination about what it meant. Did it meant they weren't Jews anymore? That what, what would they become otherwise? So Peter took them through step by step so that they would understand what new thing was happening. And he told them about the vision. He told them about the meal. He told them about what he was seeing, that God's embrace started with them, but now is encompassing the whole world and that there was no need to be afraid. And silence fell upon them. And the silence worked on them. A dawning of a new perspective and someone stitches it together. Oh, so God has given even to the Gentiles, the repentance that leads to life. That would mean we belong to each other. That would mean the walls that we thought, the boundaries that we thought would keep us safe, 
no longer need to be there. The book of Acts really is with a message. The time of fear is over. The boundaries that made us feel like these kept us safe are now being dismantled by the spirit. And there is now a creation of a new people, a new church. So I imagine after Peter had his first meal, Gentile meal in a Gentile home and Cornelius invited Peter and his men to stay with them for several months, another first to stay overnight and for several days. I imagine that these lovely days were filled with an abundant table, a table with more enigmatic foods and more enigmatic customs and manners. And it was a time of getting to know each other. I imagine they had long conversations where they studied the scriptures and the life of Christ. They had time for prayer, time for baptism. And imagine when Peter was going back to Jerusalem to talk with the church in Jerusalem. And as he packed up his donkey to get ready for the trip, I imagine Cornelius coming up to him and saying, one more gift, Peter, before you go, and handing him a scroll. Peter would open it and read, a recipe for fruitcake. Amen. <laughs>